I, I want to start by thanking um, members of the Yale Center for British Arts staff who've made special efforts towards the installation. Abigail Armistead, Mark Aronson, Alejandra Peterson Castillo, Eleanor Hughes, Rick Johnson, Lynn Bell Rose, and Eric Stegmeyer. Uh, and Paul Mitchell of Paul Mitchell Limited in London provided the frames for Mark's paintings, which you'll see upstairs. It's really been a great pleasure to work with Mark Leonard on the installation that you will see on the fourth floor of our building. He's a very talented artist, but he's also supreme, supremely professional, level-headed, and a model of kind and courteous working practices. So thank you very much, Mark, for the pleasurable experience of working with you. John Constable, who was born in 1776 and died in 1837, is an almost palpable presence here at the center. We have more than 60 paintings by Constable in the museum, making him the artist represented by the largest number of works in our paintings collection. And we also have seven pure cloud studies by the artist, the largest group of such works in any museum collection. Working with Mark to shepherd through his project allowed me to take the cloud studies off of the walls. I looked at the backs of the panels, searching for notations, and wondered at the perfect completeness of these modestly sized works. And you're seeing one um, about 15 times larger than it is upstairs, so you must come up to the exhibition afterwards and have a look. Um, but it's this kind of open reappraisal followed by a deepening historical consciousness about Constable's work that I hope Mark's daring installation will provoke. It certainly asks, and I think even demands of us as museum visitors and as art historians, to look anew at Constable's work. Mark Leonard delicately weaves a deep respect for the historical work of art with a bold contemporary practice as an artist. He's one of the most respected paintings restorers working today, and Mark has studied and treated paintings by Reynolds, Renoir, Rembrandt, and Velazquez, to name just a very few of the um, hundreds and uh, even thousands of artists um, that he's worked on. He studied art, studio art, art history, and chemistry at Oberlin College, and earned a master's degree in art history and a diploma in art conservation from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. And as Amy mentioned, he completed his training under the guidance of John Brealey at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mark then spent 26 years at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, eventually becoming head of the Paintings Conservation Department. During his last years at the Getty, Mark returned to making his own paintings and drawings again, something that he had done um, when he was a, a, a student and a, a young conservator. After stepping down from his position at the Getty, Mark spent nearly two years working on the suite of paintings upstairs. And it's interesting to me that this is about the same amount of time that Constable devoted to his cloud studies. Earlier this year, as Amy mentioned, Mark was named Chief Conservator of the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. Please join me in welcoming Mark Leonard to the podium where he will deliver a lecture titled Constable's Cloud Studies, Personal Thoughts on His Most Personal Works. Thank you, Cassandra and Amy, for those very kind words, and my heartfelt thanks to you as well for giving me the chance to take what has proven to be a wonderful journey of exploration and discovery with this project. And my thanks to all of you as well for coming this evening, some of whom I know have come very long distances, and I'm very flattered and grateful to see you in, in the audience. Um, I must also thank my friends and colleagues here at the Yale Center for British Art, who have given very generously of their time and support. I won't repeat the names that have already, already been mentioned, but let me simply extend my gratitude to everyone on staff for not only making me feel welcome, but for doing so much to facilitate my work. I mentioned that this has been a journey of sorts, and while thinking about the organization of this evening's lecture, I thought it might be best to have it follow the story of how this project came about, tracing the pathway that led to the exhibition, which is now in the galleries upstairs. As a short but important preface to that story, though, Let's begin with Constable himself, as it is his work that provided the inspiration for this project and catalyzed the journey. A great deal of art historical ink has been spilled for Constable's studies, including the cloud studies that have been the focus of my attention. And there are a number of people here tonight who know quite a lot more about Constable than I do. So there's little need for a lengthy overview of his life and work. But there are, as well, some of you who may not be so familiar with Constable, so for all of us, I thought it might be useful to set the stage with a bit of background. John Constable was born in June of 1776 in the village of East Burkholt in Suffolk, the son of Golding and Anne Constable. 
His father ran a successful milling business, which eventually expanded into a shipping business, transporting a variety of goods ranging from grain to coal on the River Stour, a river that became one of a constable's favored subjects later in life. Golding Constable thought that his son John might eventually take over the family business, but it was not to be. In 1799, Constable was admitted to study art at the Royal Academy in London, and he first exhibited his work there in 1802 at the age of 26. Although his early works included portraits and religious subjects, he ultimately followed his passion for nature and turned to landscape painting. You see one of his early masterpieces, a work commissioned in 1816 by the owner of this property, known as Wivenhoe Park, which now hangs in the National Gallery in Washington. On a personal note, this is the picture that I inevitably search for whenever I visit the National Gallery, and it is easily one of my favorites of Constable's works. It captures the perfect beauty of a perfectly glorious day in the English countryside. It is important to note, though, that the gentle beauty of nature is seen in Constable's eyes through the lens of human endeavors, and thus the fences, spillways, swans, cows, and of course the great house right at the center of it all play not only an important role in the framework of the composition, but on a deeper level, the presence underscores man's influence in taming and composing the natural landscape. Constable sold his first large canvas in 1819, the spectacular scene known as the White Horse, which is now in the Frick Collection. Uh, this is the River Stour, by the way, and we see a tow horse in a ferry crossing the river from one bank to the other. Constable famously referred to these compositions as his six-footers because they literally were six feet across. The Yale Center for British Art is fortunate to have two six-footers in its collection. The first dating to around the same time as the Frick picture, this view of Stratford Mill. This is, in fact, one of two six-foot versions of the same composition, as it was Constable's custom to produce full-scale studies of his large landscapes before producing a highly finished version of the scene. The Yale version, in this case, is the study. The finished version is in the National Gallery in London. And the surface of the Yale picture is wonderfully fresh, rough, and direct, due to the fact that it was Constable's working version of the scene. In 1821, Constable was elected an associate of the Royal Academy, and he continued to pursue a successful career from that point forward. A turning point occurred in 1828, when, after the death of his wife, his anxieties over the loss introduced a different perspective to his landscapes. The other six-footer at Yale, the magnificent view of the ruins of Hadley Castle at the mouth of the Thames, was painted in 1829 and portrays a very different relationship between man and nature. Rather than a sunlit scene depicting perfect harmonies between the natural landscape and human endeavors, we see an overwhelming vista of nature untamed after a stormy night with what have become the ruins of man's endeavors anchoring the scene at the left. But despite the depiction of decay, there was also awe, wonder, and a sense of hope introduced by the rays of light breaking through the tumbling bands of clouds that race across the vast sky. It's also interesting to note, and this is the sort of compositional detail that you hear more about later on, that Constable chose to divide the picture quite literally in two equal halves. As the horizon line moves directly across the center of the composition, adding to the sense of tension between the relentless movement of the sky and the weighty anchor of the landscape and ruins below. My focus on Constable has been, in terms of scale, on the opposite spectrum from the big six footers. Constable produced a large number of oil sketches, relatively quick sketches painted on small sheets of paper, some produced outdoors, and others in his studio. These three, all in the Yale collection and all dating to 1821, were, like all of his studies on paper, and unlike his large canvas paintings, never intended for sale or public viewing. They were personal works, used as a means of exploring ways in which to capture glimpses of the natural world that could, could then inform the more finished formality of his canvas paintings. Among the most powerful and intimate of the oil sketches were the pure cloud studies, painted during the summers of 1821 and 1822, when Constable and his family were in residence in Hempstead, just outside London. These studies have no hint of landscape, and consequently, no hint of human presence. Dozens of these seductive works have survived, such as these two brilliant examples, which have found their way to the Frick Collection, 
and they remain, quite rightly, among the most beloved and desirable works from Constable's legacy. They are, in one sense, working exercises, exploring the ways in which various atmospheric effects could be captured through the proper handling of paint. On the reverse of many of the studies, Constable jotted down the date and time, and in some cases added meteorological observations as well, as personal reminders if and when he referred to them back in the studio at some point. But for us, they are also a direct link to the uninhibited hand, eye, and mind of the artist, and provide a glimpse of an intensely personal exploration of the natural world. Nearly all of these small studies were in Constable's studio at the time of his death, as he never intended them for anything other than his own private use. It was only after his death that the paper sketches were mounted onto canvas or to panel, placed in frames, and offered for sale as finished works of art in their own right. Collectors have always been drawn to them, and fortunately for us, Mr. Mellon, who was among the most avid collectors of Constable's larger scale works, also had a passion for oil sketches. <clears throat> and that collection, which we see here in a view of Mr. Mellon's New York residence, and as it is usually installed in the galleries upstairs, now gives all of us a very public view of Constable's most private works. So with that, that bit of background, I can now begin to tell the story of my own journey with Constable, which began quite some time ago with a picture that we've already seen. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, I was working in the Paintings Conservation Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As a young conservator at the start of a career, I had the unusual privilege of finding simply extraordinary works of art sitting on my easel. One of those was the white horse from the Frick, which was cleaned by my mentor, John Brealey, who, as we've heard earlier, was also an advisor to Mr. Mellon and cared for many of the pictures in his collection. After completion of the cleaning, John entrusted me to carry out the retouching of some minor damages throughout the clouds and sky. During the time that I was, the Met, uh, during the time that I was at the Met, the department also worked with a collection of paintings from the Yale Center for British Art, due not only to John's working relationship with Mr. Mellon, but also because of his close friendship with Ted Pillsbury, who was the director of the Yale Center for British Art at that point in time. The very first picture that I cleaned and restored for Yale was this full-length portrait of the first Earl of Granville, painted by Thomas Lawrence in the early years of the 19th century. I left the Met in 1983 and headed west, where I spent the following 26 years in the Paintings Conservation Department at the J. Paul Getty Museum. Fortunately, I maintained close ties not only with the Yale Center for British Art during those years, but with the Yale University Art Gallery as well. I worked closely with Mark Aronson, who is now, I am happy to say, and as you've heard, the first in-house paintings conservator at the Yale Center for British Art, when he was working across the street. For a number of years in the late 1990s, the Getty partnered with Mark, Patty Garland, and their colleagues at the Yale University Art Gallery on a project that focused upon the gallery's collection of early Italian Renaissance paintings. Just prior to my retirement from the Getty and before Mark had moved from across the street, I had the chance to work with this self-portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, painted around 1750, when Reynolds would have been in his late 20s. So as you can see, my relationship with Yale was for many years based upon my work as a conservator. My relationship for the Constable Project, however, has been based upon my more recent work as an artist, although I am beginning to understand, largely as a result of my time spent with Constable over the past couple of years, what an important role my conservation career has played in influencing the ways in which I go about creating my own work. To that end, I thought we might take just a quick look at just one example of conservation work, and then some examples of my own work prior to the start of the Constable Project. This classically composed picture by the Northern Renaissance artist Petrus Christus, depicting the Virgin and Child in an archway, dates to 1450 and is now in the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest, Hungary, one of the world's great encyclopedic collections, and I had the chance to work on it a number of years ago at the Getty. The picture, which is on panel, entered the collection in Budapest in the late 19th century and had most likely not been touched since that time. Although beautiful and jewel-like in its precision and handling, the paint surface was buried beneath an obscuring fog of dirt and discolored varnish, and the old restorations had changed and discolored to a disturbing degree, which is particularly evident in the repainting found in a large hole at the center of the sky. Removal of the, labor, uh, removal of the layers of dirt and varnish revealed a number of old losses, most likely caused by some catastrophic event in the past when the picture was dropped or mishandled. As frightening as these losses appeared when the picture was in its clean state, it's essential to realize that they added up to a fairly minor problem. 
It's fortunate that the majority of the losses occurred in areas of drapery, landscape, and the architectural framework, and not in the superbly rendered flesh tones, so that the tender relationship between the mother and child, which is at the core of the meaning of the picture, was not interrupted. The first step in the restoration process was to underpaint the losses with a flat, water-based gouache paint that was somewhat lighter in tone and more intense in color than the surrounding areas. By doing so, a smooth, opaque foundation for reconstructing the missing areas was easily laid in place, and the losses themselves were robbed of some of their power. The strength and presence of the original began to dominate as the static noise of the damages began to disappear. Once the picture was varnished, the retouches were completed with a synthetic resin-based paint, a paint specifically manufactured for use in conservation, as it not only remains very stable, but can also be easily distinguished from the oil paint of the original work, if and when it has to be removed in the future. The damages were eventually forgotten as the restoration came to a close, and the luminous atmosphere of the scene was regained. I became a restorer through a fairly standard route, following an undergraduate course of study at Oberlin College, which was a mix of studio art, art history, and chemistry, and then moving on to New York University for graduate degrees in art history and conservation. I stopped doing my own work when I moved to New York, without regret at the time, as I had decided to focus completely on becoming a paintings restorer. Several years ago, though, I began to have urges to return to creating my own work, and I decided to begin to do so by embracing the things that I knew well, the materials that I had used in restoration for decades, and some of the pictures that I had come to know so well as they moved on and off my easel over that time. I began a series of exercises that drew from the works that I knew, such as this card players from Minneapolis by the Dutch 17th century artist Hendrik Ter Bruggen. I took a detail from the picture, the drapery in the lower right corner, and reinvented it as a figurative abstraction. When I first applied for a position at the Met back in the 1970s, I brought along a portfolio of my own paintings to show to John Brealey. He was complimentary about it, but told me straight out that he hoped that I had no intention of working both as a painter and a paintings restorer, as it would be impossible to succeed at both. During the time that I was continuing to work at the Getty as a restorer, but also starting to explore my own creative urges, I finally came to a fuller understanding of why he had taken such a firm stand on the issue. On the one hand, there's a wonderful similarity between the dialogue that takes place between the restorer and paintings on his easel, and the restorer responds to the picture as it evolves and changes during the course of treatment. In the same way, there's a dialogue between the painter and his own work on the easel, and the changes that take place during the course of creation lead the painter through the work. But there's a significant difference as well, as the restorer must disappear in service to the artist. And the painter, on the other hand, must make sure that his soul is made manifest. As my own work began to evolve, I found it increasingly difficult to turn on and turn off those two very different mindsets with ease. So I opted to retire from my conservation work in order to focus full time on my own drawings and paintings so that I could see where things might lead. I had already begun to search for a visual motif with an underlying conceptual format that I could find both visually and emotionally engaging and within just a few days of retiring, retiring, I came up with a theme that I was certain I could explore for quite some time. My thought process in this regard was, again, to embrace something that I already knew, but something that would also touch upon a larger shared human experience. I settled upon the relationship between love and loss, a relationship that everyone comes to understand, as it is nearly impossible to have love in your life without also risking the loss to which it might eventually lead. And while thinking about how those two emotional experiences are intimately woven together, the visual motif evolved quite naturally. And you see it here, and not surprisingly, I refer to these pictures as weavings. Use of a grid structure, a structure that I've always been drawn to, uh, provided an ordered underlying framework for exploration of what is, in fact, a quite a messy emotional theme. I continued to build upon my past experience with old master paintings, as in this triptych, which among other things, references the formats of Northern European Renaissance altarpieces, with wings at the left and right of the central panel, painted in grisaille. I was very fortunate that Louis Stern, whose gallery Louis Stern Fine Arts has been a mainstay of the Los Angeles art scene for many years, took an interest in my work and gave me my first solo exhibition. <clears throat> 
I was equally fortunate that Amy Myers, knowing of my long association with Yale, invited me to consider doing some work that might reflect upon the collections at the Yale Center for British Art. I spent a couple of days in New Haven, New Haven wandering the galleries, thinking about what might work. The Lawrence portrait was a logical candidate, and you see him lurking in the background of this shot of the Constable Gallery. But I kept returning to the Constable Studies, and the Cloud Studies in particular drawn in part to the fact that there is such a critical mass of them here, but also to the fact that they are, from my, aspect, my, from my perspective, such intensely personal works with such universal appeal. The project began, and of course it was inevitable, inevitable that I would start looking at clouds with a new interest. Don't worry, I won't bore you with the hundreds of photos that I took, <laughs> which would put you in the position of hapless dinner guests who were forced to look at the host's vacation photos, um, but as you might imagine, once I started looking at clouds with a new perspective, it hasn't been easy to stop. My partner Ken and I were living in the desert at this point, and this was the view from our kitchen on many evenings. There's not a lot of shared imagery between the deserts of Southern California and the gentle green landscapes of Con Constable's countryside, but there were moments when the clouds that were visible from our kitchen table, another more stormy sky seen here, were in fact surprisingly reminiscent of Constable studies, and you see another of the Yale studies here. The Yale Center for British Art supplied me with full-scale prints of all of their collection of Constable studies, <clears throat> and I immediately and randomly pinned them on the wall of my studio so that I could look at them and think about them on a daily basis. Excuse me for one second. It was clear to me that the last thing the world needed was a series of paintings of clouds, which could only stand in poor comparison to, to Constable's considerable achievements. So I instead gave thought to developing a visual motif that would reference Constable's work and resonate with it, but not replicate or imitate it. This was, in fact, quite a daunting task. And in the isolation of my studio, I found myself more fearful than hopeful about the prospects. How could I make a meaningful reference to the underlying and universally appealing conceptual themes in Constable's works? And how could my own work sit comfortably in a purely visual sense in the same galleries as the Constable studies? I managed to overcome some of those fears during a trip to London, where by fortunate coincidence, the Dulwich Picture Gallery had on view a spectacularly insightful exhibition pairing the work of the 20th century artist Cy Twombly with the work of the 17th century French painter Nicolas Poussin. I could think of no two artists who had less to do with each other visually than Twombly and Poussin, and couldn't imagine how an exhibition that integrated their work could possibly succeed. But succeed it did, in no small part because of the shared conceptual strengths that resonated between the two artists. And here you see Poussin's Rape of the Sabines below, and above it, Twombly's reflection upon the same subject. As to development of a visual motif, I wrestled with how I might continue to take advantage of the underlying framework that a compositional grid provides for exploring visual and emotional themes. And to that end, excuse me, I found an answer in an exhibition at the National Gallery in London, which explored the connections between the work of Bridget Riley, Bridget Riley whose work you see here, and old master paintings, such as the great Cezanne Bathers, from the gallery's own collection. Riley's paintings are remarkably fluid, but they are built upon an underlying grid, in this case one with strong verticals and diagonals, that allows for development of a focused and directed sense of complex and overlapping movements. And they often share much in common and work in comfortable relationship with old master paintings. I returned home from London and set to work on finding a visual motif that would reference the movement and motion of Constable's clouds. I had also begun to do a great deal of reading about Constable and about the cloud studies in particular. In his own lectures and writings, Constable often referred to the lanes of clouds that appear in the sky. And art historians often favor use of the word locomotion to describe the sense of continuous tumbling movement of Constable's clouds across his skies. Now the word locomotion does not, to my knowledge, appear anywhere in Constable's writings, but the term locomotive engine was in use to describe steam-powered engines as early as 1814. So it's not inconceivable that he was at least familiar with the term as well. In any event, thinking of a grid and thinking of locomotion reminded me of an early lesson from studio art classes, that a very simple way of drawing the repetitive tumbling movement of a rope is to make use of a grid structure to establish the framework for developing the image. <clears throat> 
A series of curved lines drawn between equally spaced points on a grid will establish the outlines of the forms, and varying the format of the grid will allow for an inf infinite variety of shapes and sizes. I liked the sense of tumbling motion that this motif suggested, as well as the underlying sense of tension. I also felt that it had good potential for resonating with the lanes of clouds that Constable composed in his studies. And here you see a rough pencil sketch on graph paper, which was my first venture in the exploration of this motif. With those thoughts in mind, I spent a very enjoyable week in residence in New Haven. Mark Aronson generously set me up in a corner of the conservation studio here. And as you can see, I was given the unique opportunity to have some of the constable studies very close at hand. I also benefited from resources of the libraries here, where I was able not only to work my way with some effort through some of Constable's writings, and my only comment in that regard is that there's a good reason why we remember Constable as a great artist and not as a brilliant writer, but I was able to bring myself up to speed on some of the science of meteorology as well, although I must admit that my self-education in that regard tended to favor illustrations in picture books such as this one rather than the more impenetrable scientific tomes. I also continued to look at clouds, and here's a view from my hotel window in New Haven during that week, the next to last of these types of shots that I'll force upon you tonight, but a shot that provides a nice segue into a closer look at Constable's clouds. Mark Aronson offered to carry out some technical studies on one of the Yale pictures. My primary interest in that regard was to have a look at the layered structure of the studies, which I hoped would confirm what seemed to be, to the naked eye, a quite straightforward method of painting. A small sample from this particular study was taken for analysis, and the area of the sample is shown here as a small red dot at the bottom edge of the composition. And the results were not altogether surprising. You're seeing the paint sample here turned on its side and under magnification, and from the bottom up, we can read the progression as follows. This remnant of a transparent yellow film at the bottom of the sample may indicate that the paper support was first prepared with a sizing in order to seal the paper fibers and prevent the oil paint from leaching medium into the paper. A comparative thick and complex layer of purplish colored paint was applied over the entire sheet of paper as a ground. There are particles of lead white, red lead, black, and most likely iron earth pigments. And as we'll see when we look at a number of other studies, this plum colored preparation not only served as an underpaint, but was left exposed in many areas to give the illusion of deep shadows in the clouds. The thin layer of paint at the very top of the sample contains primarily lead white and Prussian blue. And the increased density of the blue towards the top of the layer suggests that this may have been a wet into wet blending of several brush strokes in order to achieve the final surface effect. With this as background, it was time to begin working more directly with the studies. And I opted to take this first step by once again following my habit of turning to something that I knew well, color matching. If there's one thing that a painting restorer is required to have in his or her arsenal of tools, it's the ability to match colors. I set up a pencil grid on a panel and assigned each of the five vertical rows to one of the constable studies, and then deconstructed their palettes, moving from top to bottom across each of the compositions. In this particular study, for example, the plum-colored preparatory layer, which re remains visible throughout much of the upper portion of the composition in the shadowed underbellies of the clouds, gives way to the light Prussian blue of the sky, the silvery gray of the distant clouds, the deep Prussian blue of the horizon, and the yellow ochres of the sunlit foreground landscape. In a few of the studies, Constable did not use the plum-colored underpaint, instead relying upon the light grayish color of the paper itself as the basis for the palette, resulting in a more ethereal sense of air and atmosphere. In this particular study, he did apply what appears to be an overall layer of a slightly greenish blue color as a light underpaint, and then used a darker blue on top of that to begin to create the illusion of depth. A much lighter blue, tinted with ochre to create a yellowish gray scumble, was added as a final touch throughout the lower right corner and then the clouds were sculpted with varying shades of white and gray on top of the background of open sky. In this sunset view, a light salmon color was applied as a preliminary layer throughout much of the lower portion of the composition. And then alternating bands of yellows and varying shades of blues were used to capture the illusion of the warm light of the sun hidden behind the cool gray shadows of the clouds. <clears throat> 
In light of the fact that this, in terms of composition, is one of the simpler studies at Yale, as it primarily, fo primarily focuses upon a single lane of clouds moving across the sky, I referred to it for a pencil study of my own, first establishing grid, grid lines for the compositional borders, then providing the framework for the rope motif, and once the forms were completed, finishing up with references to the palette that Constable used in his study. This laid the groundwork for a painted response to the same composition, which you see here. The grid lines were laid out on the prepared surface of the panel, and a flat water-based gouache underpaint was used to block in the basic colors of the palette. And you can see the salmon-colored gouache at the bottom of the composition, as well as glimpses of a violet-gray colored gouache underpaint at either end of the rope. The surface was then varnished, and some of the surfaces were finished with a synthetic resin-based paint. You might recall this two-step method of painting from the retouching that we saw earlier this evening on the Budapest Petrus Christus. And it's a process that I've chosen to use in my own work, as it is not only a technique that I know well and enjoy handling, but it results in a visual sense of depth and complexity, but also creates a sense of animated vibration on the surface due to the quick drying nature of the synthetic resin paints, which must be applied in short, quick strokes. This all seemed promising, but I felt that there was still a need for an additional visual motif, one that would continue to reflect upon the imagery found in Constable's studies, but one that could also play a role in introducing an additional emotional element that would reflect some of my own interests and perspectives. As many of you know, Constable's contemporaries in Germany in the early part of the 19th century took a somewhat different approach to landscape painting, an approach that was no less attuned to the study of natural phenomena, but decidedly more romantic, more, contempl more contemplative, and more spiritual in its interpretation of man's relationship to nature. Caspar David Friedrich was the master of this tradition of German romantic landscape painting, and his work has always held an intense appeal for me. This is one of only three paintings by Friedrich in the United States, and it is a picture that I know well as I was able to repair, clean, and restore it after it was acquired by the Getty in 1993. In the moonlit twilight, a solit solitary, introspective figure stands in front of an arrangement of rocks that are, in fact, a megalithic tomb. And the entire scene is lit by the orb of the crescent moon and the nearby evening star that float above in the purple sky. The picture is, of course, a technical wonder, particularly in Friedrich's depiction of the evening fog moving into the stand of trees in the background. But at its core, it is a profound meditation upon the relationship between life and death. I thought there might prove to be a useful, useful relationship between the tumbling movement of the rope motif and the floating mystical presence of an orb motif that would work in my reflections upon Constable's studies. So on the same panel as the initial painted study, I worked up some orbs using the plum-colored underpaint from Constable's palette, which coincidentally was nicely reminiscent of Friedrich's twilight sky. And the orbs seemed to float in a comfortable relationship with the adjacent imagery. Finally, as the week began to draw to a close, I was able to see how the palettes and the motifs that I had explored might resonate with the constables themselves, as it had always been my hopeful thought that my pictures might eventually find their way into the galleries with the constable studies. One unexpected but welcome surprise for me during that week was when I was shown this extraordinary watercolor of a rainbow from the Yale Center for British Art Collections. My first thought was that it could easily be mistaken as a recent work by Ed Ruscha, but it is, of course, a work by John Constable, dating to 1827. When it was included alongside the oil sketch that had been the focus of my work during the week, everything seemed to fit comfortably. At the end of the week, we moved upstairs to the Constable Galleries for a seminar with inter interested staff from the Center and the Art Gallery. And at least as far as I know, everyone seemed pleased with the potential. And we agreed that I'd go back to the desert and get to work in earnest on the series. You'll remember this view that we saw earlier of the virtual constable gallery in my studio with the images arranged in random fashion before my week of residency in New Haven. Here's how it looked a few days after my return, ordered and arranged based upon some new in insights and a clearer sense of direction. I had decided to focus upon nine of the studies, four of the smaller landscape sketches and five of the pure cloud studies. The smaller sketches varied in size, but I wanted to have a unifying theme for the four that I had chosen, so I opted to use four panels of identical outer dimensions and tailor the painted surface on each panel to the exact size of the corresponding constable sketch. 
In light of the fact that Constable painted his studies on sheets of white paper, I opted to use white panels and to retain a border at the edges in order to not only reference Constable's original choice of a support, but to leave exposed the grid notations that I'd be using in the development of each of the compositions. As I had already spent a great deal of time with this particular study, it was the logical candidate for the first finished work of my own. And here you see it on the right, with the dimensions of the painted surface identical to the Constable study, the underlying grid notations still visible at the edges, and the palette and composition of the Constable, including the tiny strip of gray landscape which runs across the bottom edge, which is so crucial in lending a sense of scale to this diminutive work, reflected in my own vocabulary. Now, um, as an aside, this is the part of the lecture where my commentary becomes a bit tricky, as I can't refer to my own work in the same reverential terms that I'm using for the constables. And this lecture may have already crossed the boundary into hopeless self-absorption. So my apologies if my comments about my own paintings are confined to some fairly prosaic details. But I'll leave it to the paintings themselves to do the speaking, and to the critics, curators, art historians, and for all of you as viewers, to come to your own decisions as to their merit or interest and to explore what I hope you will find to be the different levels of meanings in the works. One of the landscape sketches that I found the most compelling was this small study, also from 1821, with the lanes of clouds racing across its huge expanse of sky above a sun-dappled sun -dappled sliver of landscape. At first glance, this is a simple depiction of a classically sunny day in the English countryside, as casual as if we ourselves had caught it in a tourist snapshot but in fact, there's nothing casual about it. It's important to remember that when Constable was working outdoors, the sky was in constant motion. He did not have the luxury of capturing a single moment, but had to work with many moments over the course of an hour or two, and he had to assemble those moments into a meaningful whole. If we look at the underlying structure of this composition, the rigorous assembly of the composition becomes evident. The clouds move in perfect perspectival progression from the two large shapes that float above our heads, these two here, to the overlapping lanes that blend to, into a seamless band of grays and blues at the horizon. There is a central cloud, this one right here, dead center of the composition, that displays the full range of colors from the brilliant white highlights to deeply shadowed interiors. The deep blue distant landscape is in the shape of a triangle from the lower right to the center, back down to the lower left. Reaching its peak at dead center, just below the central cloud, which enables it to act as a kind of fulcrum for the scene which moves around it. And a final stroke of brilliant white paint, right here, again placed at dead center, reinforces the centrality of the composition. Were these conscious and deliberate choices on Constable's part? We certainly don't see underlying grid lines laying out these geometric devices, so it is perhaps more appropriate to say that he was such a master of composition that he simply couldn't help but assemble a framework that achieved perfection and balance. In my reflection upon this study, I echoed the underlying structures of the composition, beginning with the weighty shapes above and a central orb which is accompanied by two supporting players. The sunlit horizontal band at the bottom reflects the light of the sky, and the triangular element has a glowing spot of white at its core. I explored similar themes in two more of the landscape sketches, focusing upon the sharp contrast between the dark, cool forms of the clouds and the startling slash of yellow light in this particular study, and building upon that chiaroscuro, an Italian word which literally means light dark, and a term that was a favorite of constables in my response. And then in this seascape, which dates to 1828, a bit later than most of the other studies, I focused upon the fact that Constable tilted his lanes of clouds so that they formed strong diagonals, moving towards the arc of landscape at the far right of the scene. After working with, this, with these smaller landscape sketches, I felt more confident to move on to the pure cloud studies, where any interest in the landscape below had given way completely to Constable's explorations of the sky above. Most of the pure cloud studies make use of two basic formats, <clears throat> one of which was almost but not quite square. The study that you see here measures just about 9 by 11 inches. It's very rare prior to the 20th century to find an artist who worked in a perfectly square format, particularly an artist such as Constable, who clearly preferred the horizontal formats to which landscapes were well suited. 
but I've always been attracted to the perfect square, given its inherent strength and insistent presence. So for the almost square cloud studies, I opted to work on 12 by 12 inch panels, and again tailored the painted surfaces to match the dimensions of the individual studies. The clouds in this particular study rush across the composition in the now familiar lanes, but the power of their movement is indicated by the strong leaning of the forms towards the right and heightened by the strong contrast between light and dark. Here's the way that my response to it began to take shape. At the underpainting stage, the orbs and ropes were blocked in with a plum-colored gouache, and the background sky was a field of light Prussian blue, tying the picture closely to Constable's original palette. And here is the final result after completion of glazing and scumbling with a synthetic resin-based paint and application of the final varnish lay layers. I'm showing you another of the pure cloud studies as I first encountered it in the form of its official photographic documentation. It was only after I had spent some time with the other studies <clears throat> and also had a chance to discuss the issue with Angus Trumbull and with Cassandra that we came to realize that as you see it now, it is in fact upside down as Constable always placed the heaviest masses of his clouds at the top of his compositions, so that they would give the impression of floating overhead, and these large forms merged into progressively smaller lanes as the scene moved towards the distance. So here it is in its proper orientation and my reflection upon it. The eye is led into the scene by means of a strong horizontal band which enters at the upper left. The central masses at the top of the composition are crowded together, adding weight and perhaps characterizing a sense of impending storm. These large forms sit directly above a distinct and brightly lit lane of clouds, which in turn is supported by consecutive and tightly packed and overlapping horizontal bands of clouds, providing a kind of visual pedestal for the dominant shapes above. Two of the most beautiful cloud studies in the Yale collection are in the second format that Constable used for these sketches which rather than being nearly square, make use of an extended horizontal sheet of paper. This format allowed for capturing a much broader, wider section of the sky, and subsequently the studies in this mode tend to be even more expansive in their sense of space and light. This study has two great masses of clouds tucked behind a lane of clouds, and this lane may not be at appar apparent at first, but there is a continuous horizontal band that runs from left to right, right across there. Smaller masses float in front of and around these main elements, and touches of blue sky lend a sense of depth. Yet despite the horizontal format, there is a centrality to the composition, which is essentially di divided down the middle by means of the bright white highlights found at the edges of the strongly backlit clouds. The study is also a bit unusual in that Constable used a warm colored underpaint, and the slight wear of the surface has exposed this preparatory layer, particularly in the large cloud, cloud mass at the left. So I opted to include that visual phenomena and bit of history in my own response. The second horizontal format study at Yale is this ethereal view of light, wispy clouds floating across a pale yet brightly lit sky. The usual distinct lanes of clouds are visible, particularly in the two horizontal bands at the bottom of the composition, which provide a visual foundation for the rest of the open scene. Isolated groups then move subtly upwards from the lower left to the upper right, heightening the sense of openness and gentle floating movement. But despite the open nature of the scene, Constable still chose to line up the clouds in the upper center directly on the vertical center line of the composition. Subtle variations in the palette also exist, notably the touch of deep blues and grays in the cloud that is exiting the scene at the far right and I've referenced that subtle increase in chiaroscuro in my response. We can finish up this overview of the series before moving on to a few footnotes about the project with one of the most powerful of Constable studies at Yale. It's an exceptionally strong picture with a bright slash of light cutting through the right center of the composition played against the powerful dark masses at the left and top. Despite the dramatic and seemingly transitory impact of the composition, as you will no doubt suspect by now, it is not just a mass of random clouds, and the emotional impact depends heavily on the underlying structure. There is a wide lane of clouds running across the bottom of the picture, right here, and three large masses that sit behind and above this lower band. The upper right and upper left corners of the composition are treated almost like spandrels, refocusing our attention back towards the center of the scene. 
Hints of blue appear here and there, not so much as a means of depicting the infinite blue sky beyond, but just suggesting its presence. Those were some of the themes that I responded to in my own work, building the composition from the bottom up, starting with a weighty band that moves from dark to light as it transverses the composition, and then condensing the strong contrast of light and shadow into a tightly packed relationship between three floating orbs. The spandrels at the upper left and right are intended to lead the eye back into the composition, and glimpses of the eternal promise of blue sky can be seen beyond the lower band. And the insistent flatness of these areas is intended to create some tension between the flat planes of, of abstraction and the illusory and insistent sense of form in the rope and orbs. When I had finished this particular study, which was the last in the series of nine smaller paintings in this project, I began to have a sense of closure. I learned quite a bit from the process of looking so intensely at Constable's work, but right from the beginning of this project, I had in mind to bring things to completion by working on two larger format panels that would echo Constable's more formal landscape compositions. On the way home back to Palm Springs after my initial week in residency at Yale, flying into the Denver airport, I was given some thought, I was giving some thought as to what shape a larger landscape might take and how I might continue a grid-like format throughout a large landscape composition. And as we approached the airport, I looked out over what was one of the most beautiful and far-reaching grids that I had ever seen, perfectly composed and cultivated fields of farmland, stretching as far as the horizon. I made a quick notation of it in my notebook, and Ken snapped this photo of it. When it came time to develop a larger format composition, it seemed logical and appropriate to use what I had learned from one of my own studies as the basis for the sky, and to place those forms as a looming presence over the perspectival grid below. And you see that initial layout in a preparatory pencil sketch. The vantage, the vantage point is quite high, inspired by the perspective that we as modern viewers of clouds often enjoy when in an airplane, but inspired as well by the fact that Constable also often composed landscape vistas as if they were seen from slightly above, which meant in some cases that the skies were seen nearly straight on, straight on emphasizing their presence and underscoring their importance. The dark band of Prussian blue at the distant horizon line and the bright white band just above it are intended to reference classic landscape painting techniques, techniques used by Constable but by, by many other landscape painters as well. And the contrast between the dark of the land where it meets the light of the sky in the far distance heightens a sense of receding depth. There remained but one more picture to complete for the series, and work on that picture coincided with an unexpected and unrelated event which involved making a move to Texas to work with the Dallas Museum of Art on the development of its in-house conservation program. And here, I promise, is the last of my cloud photos that you'll have to endure. This one, a view of sunrise from our new house in Dallas. For the second of the larger landscape compositions, I opted to return to one of Constable's works here at Yale as a point of departure. This plowing scene in Suffolk, which dates to 1824 or 1825, is a deceptively simple homage to the traditions of 17th century Dutch landscape painting. The big sky format, the receding bands of trees and fields in the distance, and the patchwork of light and shade across the countryside are particularly reminiscent of the work of Philips Koenig. And here you see a Koenig landscape from the 1670s, which now resides in the National Gallery in London. Constable's scene is an emphatically horizontal composition with layers of landscape building towards the layers of clouds which move steadfastly across the sky from left to right. The counterbalance to the movement of nature is provided by the cleverly positioned horses, horsemen, and plow right here at the center, which move from right to left as if in, as, as if in an effort to tame the onward march of the sky in the opposite direction. My own response to the picture focused more upon the contrast between the warm-hued palette of the landscape and the cool blues and grays of the sky, as well as the abstract relationships between the insistently horizontal aspects of the composition. As work on the series came to a close, conversations and planning for installing the pictures in the Constable Galleries here at Yale began to expand. Issues of framing, both in relation to Yale's constables as well as to my own pictures, were part of those conversations. I was fortunate to be able to time a visit to New Haven for a few days last summer when Paul Mitchell, long regarded as one of the world's top frame experts, was also in town, which gave all of us the chance to not only hear his well-informed guidance and advice about the framing of Yale's constables, but to explore some choices for my own pictures as well.
Many of Yale's constable studies have been framed with modern reproduction frames based upon period prototypes, and the scale and design of the moldings suit the small size and sketch-like aspects of the works. They fall somewhere between the types of simple frames that would be used for drawings or prints, works on paper, as the constable studies are, and the types of more elaborate frames that would be used for, more small, for small but more highly finished oil paintings. The Royal Academy in London has a group of constable studies that were donated by Constable's daughter Isabel in 1884, and they remain in their mid-19th century frames. And I'm grateful to Cassandra for providing these photos of two of the paintings in storage at the Royal Academy. Of course, these cannot be considered original frames, as the studies were never framed during Constable's lifetime. But they do reflect early decisions by those who were close to the artist as to how the studies could be presented. As you can see, the elegant simplicity of the 19th century moldings is not far in sentiment from the type of frames that have been chosen for many of the Yale pictures. To begin the search for frames for my pictures, Paul had turned to his extraordinary collection of period moldings and assembled a wide array of potential candidates. We spent time in the Constable Gallery with the frame corner photos, as well as a few of my own pictures. This was essential to the task, <clears throat> as I wanted to make sure that my pictures would fit comfortably, not only with the constables themselves, but within the, within the context of the constable gallery spaces. And as such, we began to focus on frames that referenced not only the studies, but in a somewhat more subtle way, the details of the architect Louis Kahn's choices of materials and finishes in this building's galleries. It's an unusual way to go about framing decisions, but in this particular case, it seemed quite a natural route to take since this is where these pictures live. While all of these issues were considered, we also realized that it would be essential to find a molding that would allow my pictures to stand on their own. The molding that we all eventually decided upon was the one that you see here. It is elegant in its simplicity, yet refined in the relationship between the forward movement of the wood surface and the gentle interior slope of the gilt surface. The wood resonates nicely with Kahn's oak architectural details in the galleries, and here you see Cassandra working with a layout of the exhibition during the same time as our frame discussions, and the oak moldings of the galleries are evident everywhere. The gilt area references the constable study frames, yet, as you see here in two Photoshop assemblies that Paul created during our conversations, the references are subtle, and the molding, though perhaps unexpected on contemporary works of art, works well with the paintings. We all agreed that it would be best to frame all of the small studies with this particular molding, which would underscore the unity of the series. For the two larger landscapes, slightly larger and more complex frames could be used, and for that purpose, we settled upon the corner sample that you see here. It obviously relates to the choice for the smaller studies, but the flatness of the molding and the stronger rhythms of the details work well with the larger format of the final two pictures. I thought I'd bring things to a close by means of one more image of my virtual constable gallery, which you see here as it looked just after I had completed work on the series of nine studies. This has been a privileged and inspirational journey for me, and I've learned a great deal. One of the more important lessons has been that I no longer need to fear the potential disconnect between my role as a paintings conservator and my role as an independent artist. Because of this project, which has given me a chance to explore a significant group of old master pictures, while at the same time exploring the themes of my own work, the two roles that had worked in conflict with one another a few years ago now seem able to coexist more happily. Constable may not have thought consciously of his studies as intensely personal works, but as they were never intended for sale, or for that matter, even for viewing outside the confines of his studio, it meant that they were unencumbered by the expectations of patrons, the demands of the market, or considerations as to how they might be presented, and thus provide us with a direct link to his private vision. They were his own exercises, prompted by a desire to understand a variety of natural phenomena, particularly the clouds, the, quote, chief organs of sentiment, to quote Constable's phrase, which he then captured by molding the imagery into carefully composed illusions. Their universal appeal is not surprising, as we have not only seen these skies, but more importantly, we have experienced them, meaning that they invoke in all of us some shared emotional memories and responses. And this type of shared experience between the artist and the viewer underlies the success of all great works of art. So we'll end this evening in the same way that we began, with Constable, 
whose work will continue to inspire, seduce, excite, and surprise us by opening our eyes not only to his personal vision, but also to the clouds and skies, and perhaps the heavens above. Thank you. <laughs>